space, the final frontier. But what do we mean when we call something a frontier? What kind of possibly culturally chauvinist, paternalistic, and possibly even colonialist mindsets are we bringing with us into space and projecting onto the new life, new civilizations, and strange new worlds that we encounter if we think of space as a frontier? Star Trek has a 55-year history as a franchise that began in 1966 with the original Star Trek series that ran on NBC from 1966 to 1969. But it wasn't until 1993 that we got a Star Trek show that began to ask these kinds of questions, that began to interrogate its own premise, its own lore, and its own internal politics. And that show was Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Because it is the first show that deals with themes of imperialism and colonialism and revolution and statecraft, definitely online socialists who happen to also be Star Trek fans tend to find the most fascinating material for discussion with Deep Space Nine. And that is why it is the subject of the newest Southpaw spinoff, where I, Angel Marti, will be guiding our beloved Southpaw host, Sam, into Star Trek fandom by watching Deep Space Nine episode by episode and analyzing it. This is the premise of the show that we are now calling Southpaw Deep Space Nine. For those of you who are unaware of Star Trek Deep Space Nine and its relationship to the greater Star Trek franchise, I'll give you a very brief overview. So, as I said, the original Star Trek series ran from 1966 to 1969 uh, on NBC and was canceled by the network because of low ratings. However, in syndication, it gained a cult following. And then, with the success of Star Wars in 1977, the franchise was revived as a motion picture series, starting in 1979 with Star Trek The Motion Picture. In 1986, after the success of Star Trek IV, it returned to television the following year with Star Trek The Next Generation, which basically continued the premise of space exploration on a new starship enterprise that was set in the 24th century as opposed to the 23rd century of the original series. Star Trek The Next Generation, of course, is the defining show for many Star Trek fans as it introduced a lot of elements and ideas to the lore that persisted through all the subsequent shows that have happened. Star Trek The Next Generation ran from 1987 to 1994, but it did not leave the airways completely devoid of Star Trek when it ended, because right before its final year, Star Trek Deep Space Nine was introduced as a way to expand the franchise and keep it going. What set Star Trek Deep Space Nine apart from the previous two Star Trek shows in all the movies was that it was based on a space station instead of a starship. So it wasn't about exploration. It was about how different cultures, different people, interacted in a static setting when they had to keep dealing with each other instead of just only seeing each other one week and then never again, like on all of the voyages of the Enterprise. So it was a way for established species like the Klingons and the Ferengi to develop more of their backstory, to become more fleshed out characters. The aliens in Deep Space Nine were able to expand from just being allegorical tools to talk about various flaws in the human race, the same way that they were used in the original series and the movies in The Next Generation, to being their own people, to really being more of different cultures that the Federation has to butt up against. And that is why there was more room for Deep Space Nine to explore things like politics and cultural chauvinism and cultural ideals. The theme was uh, the increased political sophistication of the storytelling was also met with a broader, uh, more obvious progressive change in that the captain 
the protagonist of Deep Space Nine was Benjamin Sisko, played by Avery Brooks, a black man, who is also a black single father. However, he was emotionally healthy and had a good relationship with his son and was present despite his career duties. So Deep Space Nine has a lot going on to it that is unique and at the time revolutionary, not just as far as TV in general, but also for the Star Trek franchise in and of itself. And as the show progresses, you can see an increasing contrast in the kinds of storytelling that it does compared to, say, later on, Star Trek Voyager and um, Enterprise. I'm not the biggest fan of that one. And uh, that also belies some of the interesting behind-the-scenes conflicts. Whereas the show was created by Rick Bourbon and Michael Piller, really some of the best years of Deep Space Nine's seven-year run are done under the control of Michael Piller and Ira Stephen Bear. That's usually when Berman directed uh, more of his focus to Voyager, when that started to come on the air. As a good uh, little preamble to, I think, a lot of the things that I'm probably going to say on the show, especially when it comes to shitting on Rick Berman, is to go to YouTube and watch a Renegade Cuts video, Berman Trek, where it does talk about how Deep Space Nine did a lot of great things sort of in spite of the general creative direction of the franchise as headed by Rick Berman at the time, and uh, how it was able to sort of return to some ideas of Gene Roddenberry's original vision and also make some very good and trenchant deviations. I will make sure to send a link to that video so uh, Sam can put it in the show notes of this episode. But in general, I won't just be reciting a bunch of Trek trivia like any other Star Trek podcast. There's plenty of those. But I will respond to Sam's reaction as somebody who is a uh, not a Died in the Wolf fan, but is somebody who uh, has a keen eye for uh, anti-imperialist and anti-racist analysis of media, and uh, see how Trek holds up to a new set of eyes and, uh, and an unbiased opinion, and how uh, Deep Space Nine really uh, succeeds or fails in a lot of the creative and uh, narrative gambles and risks that it takes. So if you are not a Star Trek fan already, uh, I highly recommend watching the show because I will definitely act as a good shepherd to uh, make all the obscure things clear and all the uh, um, esoteric knowledge uh, made plain. And uh, if you're a uh, Died in the Wolf fan like I am, uh, tune in anyway because we'll be looking at it from uh, a more politicized viewpoint than even... Uh, mainstream Star Trek discussion spaces tend to be. Although there have been some really good articles on StarTrek.com lately. Like, there was a good article on StarTrek.com that asked the question, does ACAB include Odo? Uh, so look for that Look for that article as well, because that'll definitely be something I reference a lot when we talk about the security chief, Odo. Again, the show is called Southpaw Deep Space Nine and will be available everywhere. That normal Southpaw is available. So please tune in, nerd out with us, and uh, let us know how you like it. Bye! <laughs>